I'm Sarah Moulden. Um, I'm from the University of East Anglia and Norwich Castle Museum where I'm doing a collaborative PhD on the um, early 19th century British artist John Sell Cotman. Um, so I'll be really quick because I know uh, we've got to get a coach. But, um, it's fine, um, there's no need to run. Really? <laughs> After all that stress. Um, so I'm, I'm really looking at um, uh, Cotman as a, a kind of case study of an artist who has to um, negotiate a really um, very competitive, congested and commercialised art world in this kind of early 19th century period. And particularly I'm interested in how an artist, um, um, artist survival, so how an artist actually has to work in that art world um, and, and do many different, multiple things to, to, in order to survive. Um, and what I'm presenting today um, is an instance in Cotman's early career um, where the community he enters, or as is the case here, re-enters, um, presents various obstacles to his initial success. Um, that community not necessarily um, stifling or hampering um, uh, creativity, um, but implicitly requiring a kind of artist who um, could make claims to originality as well as fit, so fit with a particular city or community. Uh, so what I want to think about here is how the atmosphere of a particular community, that being early 19th century Norwich, might actually have enabled the Norwich-born John Sell Cotman to invent a distinctly creative working method by which he could ensure his own uh, sense of artistic self and his own survival. And what I'm particularly interested in here are the con local conditions in which an artist operates and indeed in which artistic manoeuvres and art itself uh, get made. And just to give you a sense of the kind of um, time span that I'm looking here, I'm um, concerned with the few years um, after Cotman returns to Norwich, um, after he had um, spent an, a number of years, seven years, uh, it, working in London. Um, so I'm interested in the kind of a few years after the winter of 1806. Okay. So it was, in this, um, th it was during that winter uh, of 1806 then that the 24-year-old Cotman left London after seven years as a serious contender on the metropolitan art scene and returned to his hometown of Norwich. Soon after his arrival back in that city, Cotman wrote to the great Yarmouth banker and antiquary Dawson Turner, summarising his position as it stood at that particular moment. And he begins... In consequence of advice from several of my friends in Norwich, I have taken a house here in Wymer Street for the purpose of opening a school for drawing and design. It will give me an opportunity of turning myself about. That last phrase, turning myself about, suggests an act of changing posture or direction, a manoeuvre or a turn, enabling the possibility of different perspectives which can help get the self to a different place, geographically, vocationally, socially, perhaps even mentally, because something in the present needs to change. By the end of 1806, that something uh, was Cotman's continued survival in London, the indisputable centre of Britain's art world, which he'd entered age 17 in 1799. By then, this world was fiercely competitive with the sheer number of artists entering the field year on year, basically far exceed exceeding the demand that existed for them. The first seven years in, uh, of Cotman's career in London saw him struggle with the implications of these art world conditions. The son of a Norwich barber turned haberdasher, he had come from relatively lowly social origins in his hometown, with nothing to suggest that his family possessed the metropolitan or art world connections which could help an individual secure passage to the artistic profession. Connections which were in fact held by, we know this, um, the majority of Cotman's artist contemporaries in the British art world. And so for an artist like Cotman, who lacked the various forms of capital which could help him sustain a career in London, indeed sustain, help any artist sustain a career in London, the stakes of art world survival were raised dramatically. Moreover, in March 1806, Cotman had been turned down for membership of the newly formed Society of Painters in Watercolours, the London exhibiting institution to which the majority of his artist peers, or at least within this kind of watercolour community that he was working in at that point, had already been elected. And so with all this, and with no other paths or positions lined up in the capital to which he could turn, 
London, as it appeared to Cotman at that moment, was no longer a viable place in which he could be an artist, undoubtedly leading to a sense that he needed to try something else, or, to paraphrase his own words here, um, to turn myself about. Under the circumstances, Norwich, his hometown, could offer a relatively attractive alternative. Norwich had long been Eastern England's dominant urban hub, attracting a regional clientele of all classes who came to buy and sell at the specialist shops and Saturday market. The bustling and sprawling nature, I think, is quite wonderfully captured in now a very famous Cotman watercolour of Norwich Marketplace of 1809, and which is, was also um, engraved. Enabling this commercial exchange was Norwich's good road network out to its surrounding hinterland and also to London, with an increasing number of stagecoaches making ever more frequent journeys to the capital. Norwich also had a well-developed public sphere by this point, encompassing, as we saw, um, um, a theatre, an assembly rooms, a lively newspaper press, lecture theatres, a public library, a variety of clubs and societies, and importantly, an art world. Indeed, by the time that Cotman returned, Norwich could boast Britain's first art world outside of London if we take art world in its broadly sociological sense to mean a widely recognised intersubjective network of agents, so um, artists, publishers, critics, patrons and other, uh, to use um, uh, Howard Becker's, Becker's terms, um, support personnel. Norwich's art world had been given shape in 1803 with the formation of the Norwich Society of Artists, a formalised art society which uh, held annual exhibitions during the summertime Assize Week in rooms in the centre of town. Throughout its 30-year history, the Norwich Society maintained good links with London, particularly with the Royal Academy at Somerset House, which provided it with a kind of central central reference point. Um, and certainly the Norwich Society um, based its administration, its rules, its, um, the format of its um, exhibition catalogues with their mottos on the um, Royal Academy's own. Some Royal Academicians too, notably William Beachy and John Opie, had links with Norwich and its regional art world and occasionally exhibited with the society there. And so um, I guess what I'm getting at here is that there's a way in which um, Cotton was, was not just kind of projecting all of this onto Norwich and just hoping that somehow um, the city had the kind of um, enabling structures that could enable the, the kind of relaunch of his career. Um, he was not, I want to emphasise, just returning to his hometown where his family still lived, but a city with um, the artistic, the social and communication networks for the potential relaunch of his career. And yet nothing could ever be that easy for the very structures that made Norwich an attractive place for an artist to operate were also those that made it distinctly competitive. And while the city could indeed offer Cotman a viable place in which to re-emerge as an artist, it also had its own assortment of cultural nuances and complexities which had to be carefully managed if he was going to succeed in passing himself off. And so what I want to consider in, in this paper is some of the strategies that Cotman employed in Norwich in order to kind of turn himself about. Strategies which at first seem um, to have actually been rather off course and sh uh, show Cotman to have initially misjudged the city's cultural atmosphere. Um, I'll then go on to consider how he attempted to renegotiate his somewhat contested position in the city by reassessing and turning about his artistic strategy in order to strike a better and more appropriate balance between the needs of Norwich and his own sense of artistic creative self. Okay, so the first manoeuvres that he makes. It's clear um, that Cotman aimed to make his presence felt in Norwich, I think, um, immediately following his return from London in 1806, uh, for on the 29th of December of that year, he opened a huge one-man exhibition in his new large house on Wymer Street, which was situated just off um, the central marketplace. It's surprising that this one-man exhibition has been entirely overlooked in the Cotman literature because it can um, tell us uh, much about how he sought to position and present himself at that particular time and place, I think. Lasting for two months, the show initially consisted of 400 artworks, 
soon climbing to 500 works by mid-January, and which really constitutes this kind of unprecedented number of exhibits in kind of artists' exhibiting culture at this time in Britain. Over its rather lengthy duration, Cotman posted more than a dozen adverts in the local press, this one here appearing um, just a week before the show opened on the 29th. And you'll see at the top that he's titled it School for Painting in Watercolours and for Design, reflecting his aim as he'd recently relayed it um, to Dawson Turner in that letter with which I began. Yet any information about this school quickly capitulates to the promotion of the exhibition, which Cotman describes rather audaciously as a scheme almost too daring for an individual. He also spins it as if it were a retrospective show, this thing about the labours of seven years, with all its suggestions of a seasoned career, um, years of experience and an artistic oeuvre, and he's 24. No precedents existed in Norwich for one-man shows, and indeed we might say that going solo in this way was rather characteristic of artistic strategy in the London art world. As Konstantinos Stefanis has recently shown, London had seen an increasing number of one-man shows since 1775 when Nathaniel Hone staged his monographic retrospective in rented rooms in St Martin's Lane. Thereafter, other artists, including Thomas Gainsborough, Joseph Wright of Derby, John Singleton Copley and Francis Town, held an increasing number of solo exhibitions in London. And it's, um, it's possible that uh, Cotman saw um, Francis Town's uh, relatively large um, solo exhibition um, of 192 works in, uh, I think it was 1805, that Town staged that in Brook Street in London. Cotman's no Norwich exhibition, however, differed in a few significant respects to these London-based shows. These exhi those exhibitors were all in their 50s or 60s when they showed independently, usually doing so following moments of antagonism with the Royal Academy, and presenting a much smaller selection of their works, but spanning their much longer careers. In contrast, as I say, Cotman was 24 years old at this moment, presenting up to 500 works, as if retrospectively. And you'll see here from the first ad that he notes um, the number of works of, as upwards of 400 drawings, before noting the increase to 500 works you see there in the underlined part. Um, it, which is the third advert which he posts um, three weeks later. Cotman's one-man show thus appears all the more ambitious with this huge number of works um, and as an early career manoeuvre and therefore no less precocious. And yet nothing in the archival record suggests that the show was a success or indeed that it made the splash that Cotman had undoubtedly intended given its huge scale and level of promotion. With no press reviews or any mentions of the show in local correspondence, it seems to have been a flop. Gaps in the archive are not, however, opaque to analysis, and we can, I think, get a sense of why this outcome may have been so by considering that of Cotman's Drawing School, which the majority of these adverts um, put in their title and promoted in that way. Information pertaining to this school uh, were, was not given until Cotman's uh, third advert, same advert here, um, which was posted in the Norwich newspapers on the 10th of January 1807. And in it, uh, right at the bottom, he informs his putative clients that he will, quote, commence his instructions on Monday the 19th of January 1807. Terms in the academy by the quarter were to be two guineas, while four private lessons were at one guinea terms which were actually uh, rather uh, expensive when compared to those charged by other Norwich drawing school masters who tended to ask just under half, um, a little under half of Cotman's prices. Only one more advert concerning the school was posted by Cotman after uh, the exhibition had closed in mid-February and for which I'm afraid I don't have a slide, um, but in it, um, and rather tellingly, uh, he gives the place of teaching as uh, Cotman's house, Mr. Cotman's house, rather than his school or his academy, as he'd initially referred to it um, in, in his previous adverts. <coughs> then after mid-February, no further adverts appeared in the local press. While no news may indicate that all was going well with the school, the disappearance of these adverts differs markedly to Cotman's initial use of the press 
and also to that of his competitors who regularly advertised their own drawing schools in the Norwich, news uh, yeah, in the Norwich newspapers. Indeed, competition from other local drawing school masters may well have posed a problem for the sustainability of Cotman's own, the number of other schools in the city having mushroomed over the previous decade in line with drawing's growing popularity as a genteel accomplishment amongst the upper and mercantile classes across the nation. Many of Norwich's drawing schools were also situated uh, close to Cotman's house, with one of the most popular run by Charles Hodgson, located just a few doors down. All this appears to suggest then that Cotman's school was a bit of a non-starter, a final clue to which comes a few years later, in December 1811, when Cotman wrote to Dawson Turner, who was then soliciting the artist to tutor his daughters in Great Yarmouth, and in this letter, Cotman asked Turner to elucidate the nature of this proposed teaching position, for, he says, and I quote, I am a perfect stranger to teaching school fashion, a remark which would seem a little odd unless his drawing school had faded as a component in his working life in the intervening years. And so all this, together with what Cotman did next, which I'll turn to um, momentarily, suggests that the drawing school never fully took off, a similar conclusion which we might also posit for the outcome of his one-man exhibition. If we entertain the possibility that Cotman got off on the wrong foot with his initial manoeuvres in Norwich, it appears to have been because he confronted the limits of the city. To become a part of Norwich's art world was not automatically straightforward, simply because it was much smaller than London and was uh, London's art world and was situated 100 miles away. With a much smaller population, Norwich was already well stocked with individuals connected to its regional art world. In 1806, the Norwich Mercury praised the number of exhibitors at that year's uh, Norwich Society show, who, the critic puffed, uh, composed one-sixth of the members of the whole kingdom, ever, which the whole kingdom ever brings together in the annual exhibition at Somerset House. Besides these Norwich Society ex exhibitors, there were also many non-exhibiting miniaturists, drawing masters, portraitists, engravers, who were listed in the local adverts or the Norwich directories, and all of whom were based locally. So um, there's some real competition going on at this stage, and right at the moment uh, of Cotman's return in 1806. This sense of competition was exacerbated by Norwich's lack of a strong local patronage base for contemporary art, and specifically contemporary watercolour. Indeed, those local merchants and landowners who did collect art tended to do so of old master paintings and prints, which were then flooding the British markets as continental collections were broken up during the French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars. As early as 1808, the editors of the Norwich Mercury and Chronicle were appealing to the local public for support of their artists, appeals which continued into the 1820s as the lack of patronage posed an increasing threat to the city's continued cultural health. Experience, lamented the Mercury in 1823, has taught our artists the meaning of the word patronage, the foster mother of genius, is totally and entirely unknown in Norwich. This discrepancy between supply and demand was something we remember that Cotman had experienced back in London at the very start of his career, but the patronage situation in Norwich was aggravated still further by its diminishing economic fortunes as its core textile industry underwent dramatic decline at the end of the 18th century as the centre of production and trade moved northwards to Yorkshire. And so what I want to suggest is that for a young artist, uh, to have returned to Norwich from the capital and to have immediately staged an enormous solo exhibition distinctively metropolitan in character and to have advertised yet another comparatively expensive drawing school risked appearing somewhat brash and disruptive of the balance of Norwich's art world. If Cotman was going to turn himself about in Norwich, he could not force upon it something like a sui generis art world spun out from himself, this thing about an exhibition, an academy, um, and he's also starting to exhibit at the uh, uh, Norwich Society of Artists at this point. If Cotman was going to turn himself up, uh, sorry, um, the flash in the pan uh, displays of individual ambition had little purchase in Norwich, 
nor indeed did a teaching establishment of the sort shaped by so many other pre-established artists in the city. Instead, Cotman would need to respond to the local conditions of Norwich and its art world, find the gaps in the market and negotiate the city's possibility with its limits by finding some kind of middle way. That middle way was Cotman's so-called circulating collection of drawings, which involved him taking his art out of the space of his Wymer Street house and circulating it directly within Norwich's public sphere. The circulating collection was basically a huge uh, compilation of Cotman's own graphic material, which he built up in the years um, after his one-man show and uh, the promotion of his um, school. Um, and uh, which he lent out to subscribers in Norwich for a fee. And while loaning uh, drawings to amateurs was not uncommon in drawing master practices, nothing came close to the longevity or scale of Cotman's circulating collection, with 600 drawings in circulation by the time it was launched in Norwich in 1809, and with several thousand uh, in circulation by his death in 1842. And so in the time I have remaining, I want to consider uh, this circulating collection as Cotman's next substantial and indeed more sustainable bid to manage Norwich's art world and, place, uh, and his place within it. The collection enabled him to offer the city something different from his competitors and yet familiar enough to suit local tastes. At the same time, it gave Cotman the opportunity to retain his own sense of self as an ambitious, professional and creative artist with a capital A, as opposed to a drawing master, which I'll expand on uh, shortly. And so I'm interested here, uh, interested in here, uh, as the in the circulating collection as a kind of um, balancing act that Cotman plays out in Norwich um, after 1809. Um, the first reference to the circulating collection appeared in July 1809, and exactly where one uh, might expect to find it, in the advertisement section of the Norwich newspapers. And it's worth noting straight off that Cotman has changed tack here from uh, the tone employed in his previous adverts. Despite the novelty of a circulating collection of drawings in Norwich, note that Cotman now refrains from making those bold assertions of his project's individual and daring nature as he'd done for his one-man show. Instead, he likens his collection to a circulating library of books, a service which had proved uh, popular in Norwich since the mid-18th century and which suited the city's compact size and regional transport networks, its polite aspirations and high literacy levels. By revealing the model of his collection here, Gottman seems to be making a concerted effort to present his product as something to which the Norwich public could easily relate. Yet unlike a circulating library, Gottman's collection was made entirely by his own hand, and which he, the author himself, delivered to his customers, thereby sort of attesting to the originality um, and the inherent quality, I guess, of, of his product. Compared to the terms of his drawing school, this was also an affordable service. A quarterly subscription ticket cost one guinea, which seems to have had the effect of attracting many subscribers and accordingly good returns. An example of the kind of drawing which Cotman claimed to launch his collection in 1809 was this still life which notably was also shown publicly that year in the Norwich Society exhibition under the title Fish Swills. Swills being um, those wicker baskets which are used um, to, to um, store freshly caught fish. This watercolour, uh, together with 23 others which he showed in the same exhibition, um, were marked out in the exhibition catalogue as specimens and were accompanied by the line these drawings are from Mr. Cotman's circulating portfolios, now open to the public on the plan of a circulating library. So again, he's referencing this familiar model in the very public space of the exhibition room um, and also associating um, his exhibited art, liberal art, with um, his circulated copy material, which is you know, copied by amateurs. While the blocky delineation of the motifs in fish swills is entirely in keeping with the style of Cotman's other watercolours from this period, and certainly those that he exhibited at this time, it's difficult, however, 
um, to conceive of a beginner being proficient enough to make a, straight, uh, make a straightforward copy of this. Where and how the copyist might commence imitation is unclear. The loose description of the drawing's various component parts is actually rather complex, with few clear outlines for a beginner to trace and little clarity of parts to render the image fully comprehensible. Are those green strokes behind the furthest swill meant to represent loose grasses or seaweed? Are they behind the swill or are they in it? And what exactly are the red roll and flash of blue supposed to represent? So right in the, in the kind of top of the composition in the possibly the furthest swill. It's not quite clear. Rather than read the apparent discrepancy here between the drawing status as exhibited art and teaching material as a bluff on Cotman's part, i.e. he was lying in the exhibition catalogue and the, this was um, never meant to be um, a drawing copy despite its promotion as such, we might instead interpret this drawing as a ploy on Cotman's part to demonstrate his artistic skill to potential subscribers who wanted to learn from a liberal exhibiting artist one furthermore who offered up his own artwork for them to copy. And certainly in art world discourse of the time, um, skillful looseness and unfinish in art, and particularly watercolour, was deemed by many to be a sign of an artist's creative genius. Furthermore, for those amateurs who fancied themselves as relatively accomplished artist, artists, mm. a drawing like fish wheels might play to their aspirations, offering them both a challenge and a model of future artistic achievement. At the same time, the looseness of a drawing such as this and its disobedience to line seem to have fed into Cotman's attempt, attempts to dodge the contested identity of the full-time drawing master. Indeed, as Anne Birmingham and Greg Smith have shown, the drawing master's profession was attended by the widespread perception that it corroded artistic creativity because it required him or her to produce a kind of debased form of their own art to compensate for their pupils' limited capabilities. But by producing copy drawings in a style remarkably close to those works which Cotman associated with his own creative persona, as is patently the case with the exhibited fish swills, he could attempt to dislocate himself and his circulating drawings from these uh, more pejorative associations. Moreover, unlike the majority of drawing masters whose teaching material intend to, sorry, whose teaching methods tended to involve giving students simple demonstrations or supervising their copying of simple drawings, Cotman kept mobile, offering his subscribers only a minimal amount of one-to-one -one interaction. And you'll see from this first advert here um, that he says he delivers the drawings uh, to, to the subscribers so that he may facilitate their copying by his instructions, a line which suggests a, a rather passive rather than an active interaction with the subscribers who are notably um, not referred to as his pupils. Likewise, the reference to his instructions denotes a degree of authority on Cotman's part. Indeed, any interaction with the subscribers seems merely to involve Cotman's um, indicating uh, how they might proceed or improve in their copying of his drawings rather than kind of guide them step by step. Besides, the two hours in which he claimed to make the day's deliveries suggest that there was little time to do even this. Cotman was therefore attempting a rather canny balancing act, I think, with this circulating collection. By spinning it as a high-quality product aimed at the consumer and for which it was up to them to get out of it what they wanted, he could play to their aspirations. But with limited uh, delivery hours, little or no teaching involved, and with drawings in circulation which were not a debased form of his own art, he could attempt to retain this kind of individual creative persona. Indeed, there was no need for Cotman to bow to his subscribers' abilities because he resisted styling himself as their teacher. Instead, he identified with the profession of artist, listing himself as such in the new Norwich Directory of 1811. So by way of um, a very brief um, conclusion, I want to suggest that what we're seeing here with the case of Cotman in Norwich is an individual whose various career turns um, following his uh, return from London 
demonstrate the necessity for him to have remained highly responsive to the nuances of Norwich's cultural atmosphere, trying out a number of different things in order to turn himself about and manage its regional art world. And while he initially had got off to the wrong foot in Norwich um, with you know, the one-man show in the school, those initial manoeuvres and their apparent failure appear to have forced Cotman to turn his pr- approach about in order to enable a route towards something more workable, both for Norwich and for himself, a balancing act which might just have enabled uh, his survival in an increasingly competitive art world in Britain. Thank you. So I'm Matthew Ward. I um, just started the third year of my PhD at uh, the University of St Andrews, um, where I work on romantic poetry, uh, or laughter in romantic poetry. So I thought I'd take the opportunity that this workshop provides to speculate on a topic that hasn't been part of my PhD thesis, but is something I'm intrigued by and can't entirely make sense of, and that's the research undertaken by Humphrey Davy into nitrous oxide at the Pneumatic Institute at the Hotwells area of Bristol. Davy, a young and highly ambitious experimenter at the time, took up a position at the institution in, at the institute in 1799. Run by the politically radical Thomas Beddoes, the institute was conceived as a medical research centre to uncover new treatments for pulmonary diseases and was set up specifically so as to investigate the usefulness of some of the gases Joseph Priestley had discovered. He discovered nitrous oxide in 1776. The published account of these investigations, researches, chemical and philosophical, chiefly concerning nitrous oxide, was published in 1800, and shows Davy methodically but quite quickly deciding on nitrous oxide as the most likely to yield therapeutic results. Over time, Davy's interest extends beyond any medicinal effect it might have, however. The influence on human physiology, the response of the senses to the stimulus, and especially the psychological and emotional transport roused by breathing the gas increasingly fascinated Davy. Work by a number of recent critics, notably Richard Holmes and most especially Sharon Rustin, has identified Davy as a romantic figure and the nitrous oxide experiments as indicative of a kind of romantic creative genius, locatable in the emerging scientific field at the time. Their work and that of other, others builds on a tradition of locating Davy within the field of romantic science that has been given such vitality in recent decades by Kathleen Co, Kathleen Coburn, Trevor Lefebvre, Ian Wiley, Nicholas Rowe and numerous others. Consequently, we might read nitrous oxide as emblematic of the way in which the inhaling of gas is emblematic to the absorption of scientific thinking into literature and how a poetic sensibility was infused in scientific endeavour. We might, in other words, use the testimony of those involved and writing from others closely connected to the research as a way of thinking about the kinds of creativity that may occur when scientific research and literary conventions collide, the kinds of language used or borrowed, how those involved think and feel about what happens to them, and how this is all framed within the cultural paradigm of terms like genius and inspiration, can help us to consider the question of individuality in a close-knit community engaged in the process of creation, whether that be scientific or and poetic, Hopefully these issues will be implicit in what I go on to say and might be developed further during any conversations we may have time for today. Perhaps more relatable to the broader interest of this particular workshop, we might also reflect upon what Bristol might have offered Davy and others at the time from a political perspective and the associations that formed around nitrous oxide as symbolic of a dangerous radical enthusiasm What I'm especially interested in trying to do in this paper, however, is to try and think about humour in relation to experiences or expressions of sublimity. These thoughts aren't even close to being fully developed or quite worked out yet, and I'm not even convinced that a link between humour and the sublime can be made in a particularly convincing way. This paper, then, is a way of throwing myself on your mercy in the shameless <laughs> hope of getting some feedback from you all about these issues 
even if that feedback is that this idea doesn't really work or that it has worked for others that I haven't quite read yet. So for MHA brands, air in motion, be it breeze or breath, the wind or respiration, was not only a property of the landscape, but also a vehicle for radical changes in the poet's mind, part of a complex objective process. Abrams was referring principally to those aerial metaphors of creative inspiration we have come to associate with the Romantic period, the harp, the lyre and the west wind. But, as I alluded to earlier, more recent criticism, particularly that of Ruston, has convincingly aligned both Davy and the nitrous oxide experiments with romantic conceptions of poetic inspiration, and have done so through the idea of the sublime. And I want to accept this critical position and develop some thoughts about the sublime in relation to humour. But one of the obvious difficulties in doing this is the vast ways in which the sublime and for that matter, humour is understood. As Nicola Trott very helpfully explains in an essay on the sublime, the sublime is used and conceived in ways which leads to it being ascribed to different things without there always being a clear idea of what is meant. And I think this is often the case with the nitrous oxide experiments, actually. The participants and documenters of the research, including Robert Southey and Samuel Taylor Coleridge, often use the term in a shaky and unstable way and make it extremely difficult to locate quite what is meant by the term. Um, you almost sort of wonder at times whether, in a sense, it just refers to the highest um, in a very loose way, really. Um, the sublime has been conceived, Trot explains, as God-dependent in Coleridge, God-denying in Shelley, as physiological in Burke and transcendent in Kant, being read in, as invoking unity or refusing closure, as inhering in the object or in the mind, as involving the senses or referring to reason, and as diminishing or magnifying the human subject, or indeed both in, uh, in succession as Kant and Schiller. Also, is the sublime rhetorical or part of nature? Is it empiricist or idealist? If we read Wieskel's The Romantic Sublime or Ferguson's Solitude in the Sublime, the Romantic era is one that psychologises and internalises the sublime. Consulting Ryan's recent article, The Physiological Sublime, and Richardson's Neural Sublime, meanwhile, we find a rival discourse that might lead us to conclude that the sublime in the period is associated more with the material and with stretching and rupture. One thing that does seem to be agreed on is that the sublime denotes something that escapes the limits of representation, that it is an aesthetic of non-representability. And I want to stick just with this for a moment, for it is in this way at least that the sublime and a sense of humour would seem to have something in common. This might initially strike us as odd, given that for Burke there is nothing amusing about the sublime. He says the terror is in all cases whatsoever, either more openly or latently the ruling principle of the sublime. While in genre terms, of course, Kant aligned the sublime with tragedy, and Schiller's On Pathos in 1793 followed this tradition by associating sublimity with tragedy and the beautiful with comedy. But we all know how easily the sublime can slip into the ridiculous. Even so, our awareness of this slippage is predicated on the notion that they are distinct literary modes and differing states of mind. However, we might conceive of them as related in the sense that both sublimity and humour can be concerned with the inadequacy of human consciousness to make sense of extreme or peculiar things beyond our expectations. Each demands immediacy, and each becomes momentarily all-encompassing, surprising and astonishing us in ways that can make us reassess our acts of comprehension. Not being able to rationally understand something can be terrifying, of course, and Burke's formulation of the sublime, say, operates via this traumatic anxiety in the frightening vacancy our minds, of our mind's ability to reason with the unfathomable. Discovering one's inability to find a language fitting for an experience that by its definition defies comprehension may be disorientating. 
As we grasp for the material to make our experience understood, we are faced with the discrepancy between our felt experience and how that experience may be rationally explained. We might decide to understand this as our tragic incapacity, but from another perspective, one based on a comic appreciation of ourselves, our confusion and inarticulacy can be highly amusing and lead to comic incidents. As, for instance, in the experience of Tom Wedgwood, who had contributed £1,000 to Beddoes to help set up the Institute, and whom many hoped would find a curative benefit in nitrous oxide for his mental and physical fragility. Briefly made euphoric by its power, he writes in Davies' researches, I became, as it were, entranced when I threw the bag from me and kept breathing on furiously with an open mouth and holding my nose with my hand, having no power to take it away, though aware of the ridiculous of my situation. The most singular sensation I had, I feel it impossible accurately to describe. It was as if all the muscles of the body were put into a violent vibratory motion. I had a very strong inclination to make odd antic motions with my hands and feet. Wedgwood's humorous attempt to make sense of the experience would seem influenced both by David Hartley's observations on man, which proposed that sensations are vibrations that play along the body's nerves, and also his friend Coleridge's Effusion 35, first composed in 1795. Such borrowings provide intriguing examples of the subtle interaction between scientific description and poetic language, particularly amidst this close-knit regional community at this time, and the necessity to resort back to terms previously identified in order to try and understand this fresh experience. Davies' account from the 5th of May 1799, when he took an especially large dose of nitrous oxide, documents his attempts at communicating the inexplicable experience to his assistant. Later a writing empirically of the pleasurable sensation being at first local and perceived in the lips and about the cheeks, and how gradually this diffused itself over the whole body, and in the middle of the experiment was for a moment so intense and pure as to absorb existence. At this moment, and not before, I lost consciousness. But it is quickly restored, and I endeavoured to make a bystander acquainted with the pleasure I experienced by laughing and stamping. Davy casts himself as a figure of genius in the way he ascribes his musing mind as labouring to convey the irresistible experience. But he also casts himself as a comic buffoon as he laughs and stamps his feet like a fool. He tries to reassert control of his experience by conveying that experience, but this leads merely to a performance of his own inarticulacy, his own limitations in the face of the incomprehensible. The impasse seems funny not only to the reader, but amusing to him as well. For Sharon Ruston, Davies' sublime is more Kantian than Burkean, since a sense of empowerment follows the initial feeling of being overpowered in an encounter with what Kant terms the mathematical sublime. But at this moment, Davies' experience might also be said to be comparable to Burke's understanding. Either way, the only recourse for David at this moment, when faced with the incomprehensible, is to frantically laugh and stamp his feet. As his mental dexterity has reached the limit of its ability to articulate what it is experiencing, he falls back on an inarticulacy that tries to act as a means of conveying his feelings, even as it simultaneously acknowledges an amusing inability to do so. All this may strike us, possibly quite rightly, as a rather superficial relation. And I wonder how much further the connection can really be taken on this point. But perhaps one way of keeping this idea going a little longer might be to more comprehensively shift attention from the object that causes bewilderment to the way the mind perceives that object and tries to make sense of it. Joseph Priestley seemed to understand the sublime not as contained within the object itself, but in terms used to describe it. For Burke, objects are not sublime of themselves, not intrinsic to their nature, but also by the emotion stirred and language used. 
as I previously alluded to, the rhetoric of the sublime is one understanding of it. And one of the ways many of those involved in the experiments try to situate their experiences of nitrous oxide is through a language of otherworldliness. Salvi was ebullient when writing to his brother Tom on the evening of his first taste of nitrous oxide in July 1799. He says, Davy has actually invented a new pleasure for which language has no name. Oh, Tom, I'm going back for more this evening. <laughs> it makes one strong and happy, so gloriously happy. Oh, excellent airbag. <laughs> the following month, he, writes to da- he wrote to Davy to say that the gas, according to my notions of celestial enjoyment, must certainly constitute the atmosphere of the highest of all possible heavens. Saudi who in his first encounter also displays terror at the sight of the mouthpiece, intriguingly admits that this new thrilling sensation is outside the limits of the current terms of language. Yet in the same breath, he opts for a language that is grand in scale, with the gas taking on a sublime dimension. And the result is humorous. While playing up to the pleasure of the sublime, we might feel there is an amusing oddity to an apostrophe to an airbag. It feels somehow overinflated, and the allusion to the divine, highest of heavens, the cosmic, celestial, and the magical, a new pleasure for which language has no name, to describe a noxious gas is itself hyperbolic and comic. But then there is a good reason for this humorous result. Sally's pairing of a known and material substance with the sublime chimes with 18th century ideas of humour deriving largely from Locke's definition of wit as the assemblage of differing ideas wherein can be found any resemblance or congruity. What has become known as the incongruity theory of humour developed into a dominant explanation for why we laugh and is still favoured by philosophers and theorists today. When Saudi aligns nitrous oxide with notions of transcendence, he implicitly uses incongruity in order to explain what he feels was a sublime experience, he uses terms that are sublime within a method of humour. Where does this get us? Well, there's a similarity between this process of humour and the aesthetic principle of someone like Wordsworth, who tied not only pleasure, but also the great spring of the activity of our minds and their chief feeder, he said, to the perception of similitude in dissimilitude. The humorous and creative mind is involved in a process that seeks to, um, to imagine relations between things otherwise apparently unconnected. And we might say that the mind's ability to create relations between distinct things is sublime, proof of a Kantian mastery of nature's infinite variety and the imagination's insight into laws or motions of connection. For Davy, the ability to discern the way particular details might be part of a larger whole, something that the process of chemistry, he believed, perfectly allowed for, makes the scientific process and the mind practising it sublime. For Coleridge and Wordsworth, to see into the life of things and discern the interconnectedness of nature is of course a famous ambition. But the perception of similitude and dissimilitude is also a process of humour which things like puns and jokes require. It would appear that there's at least a methodological similarity between humour and the sublime, in this instance at least, if not necessarily a similar intended outcome or ambition, so the same means but with different aims intended perhaps. I'm finishing in a few minutes, but I want to try and bring these things together a little more via Coleridge, who at least once delighted in comparing the inspiration of an intellectual breeze, the sort more commonly thought of in relation to romantic inspiration, with nitrous oxide. After leaving Davy and the experiments behind in Bristol, he travelled north to Cumbria and to Wordsworth. When he writes to Davy from Keswick, in the summer of 1800, he describes a community laughing and dancing in the lakes, which has some resemblance to the jovial, sociable, and arguably democratic atmosphere created at the Pneumatic Institute. 
he had recently left, and thus he transplants the scientific and urban setting onto a natural landscape. In the letter, he describes his son Hartley, often imagined as a son of nature, of course, as a spirit that dances on an aspen leaf. The air that yonder sallow-faced and yawning tourist is breathing is to my babe a perpetual nitrous oxide. Coleridge's comparison between the tourist lethargy, the notion of figure merely passing through, untouched and unaware of the prospects of the inspirational atmosphere, and his child's intoxicated response to it, whimsically, if somewhat crudely, invokes notions of romantic genius. The use of nitrous oxide in relation to the air in the lakes may be understood as a double movement on Coleridge's part, acknowledging the close ties between himself and Davy, paying homage to the intellectual and humorous incidents they shared, but also signalling that he is moving on to other friendships and inspirations in Cumbria. It is one of those typically conjoined moments in Coleridge where a transition is seen in the mingling of influences that have been left behind within one new idea. The light-hearted connection made between the fresh air of the Lake District and the nitrous oxide he joined in Bristol is on one level absurd. Like much of what I've been discussing, it's an act of bathos. But not so much a movement sinking ignobly into lowness that might annihilate any desired effect, but, one, but rather one that realises that these depths are precisely where sublime experiences occur, be they in nature or a laboratory, through air or noxious gas. A reviewer of Critique of Pure Reason, who dared to regard it as a work of high idealism, was given short thrift by Kant, by no means higher, he said, my place is the fruitful, the fruitful bathos of experience. And isn't that how certain romantic thinking uh, functions? Wordsworth's poetic register springs immediately to mind. I noticed this week that Essays in Criticism has just published an article once, that once again identifies the poet's sense of wonder in common and often odd things. Thomas Carlyle has a nice phrase for this type of activity. He says that humour is a sort of inverse sublimity, exalting, as it were, into our affections what is below us, while sublimity draws down into our affections what is above us. Carlyle's remark is really helpful, I think. Um, that's where I want to end, not least in the way it interprets humour as a mirror of the sublime but also in the sense that as a mirror of the sublime, humour might reflect, to us, uh, reflect for us that sublimity can be glimpsed in comic incidents like those ex exhibited during the nitrous oxide experiments. Thank you. I'm Jenny Wilkes. I'm at the University of York doing a PhD on literary and philosophical societies in the north of England between about 17, 16, 1840, which is a bit of a broad topic and to be honest I'm not really 100% <laughs> sure what, what it is yet going to look like. I'm also working on the John Mee's project about networks of improvement which looks at literary clubs and societies um, in Britain, 1760 to 1840, and it's quite closely connected. This paper is basically a sort of really uh, condensed version of the work that I've done so far, um, which has been on uh, Manchester and Newcastle. Unfortunately, I'm a bit guilty of focusing a slightly too much on facts so far so that like the fact that I've had to write this paper has made me think a lot about how it's all going to be connected um, so hopefully it's going to make some sense um, so I'm interested in um, sort of how provincial literary uh, and philosophical societies formed a network like how they were sort of establishing themselves against the the metropolis uh, as provincial um, societies and I'm interested within the societies I'm specifically interested in sort of sociability and how literature was discussed 
between members. Um, that's another question in itself, what is literature, but anyway. Um, so the, the Manchester Lit Film was established in 1781, um, and it was dominated by former students and tutors of the Warrington Academy. And I think that's quite important. Um, and it could be said to be a sort of continuation of Warrington, a sort of university of dissent. Um, and then Newcastle, which was 1793, um, was influenced quite a lot by Manchester. Um, that was set up by the Reverend William Turner, who was a former student of Warrington and who had been an honorary member of Manchester. So I'm interested in how far the, these two societies can be said to, uh, to have formed a provincial network. And I'm, I am going to uh, do some work, I'm going to write more about different societies, but these are the two that I've done so far. So, so sort of a network which began in the days of Warrington um, and sort of a continuation of sort of Scottish Enlightenment ideas about, about um, improvement, uh, taste and polite learning. Um, so I'm going to sort of look at each society in a, in a sort of factual way to start and then sort of draw the two together. Um, I'm going to focus on sort of tensions within each society about ideas of um, improvement and sociability. Um, about the diffusion of knowledge and conversation and all those sorts of things. So the Manchester Lytton Phil uh, was formed in 1781 um, by Thomas Percival. Um, he was sort of the main founder. He was like the leading figure, a uh, central figure in Manchester's intellectual circles. He held weekly informal meetings at his house and it's from these meetings that the Lytton Phil originated. Um, so the, in the words, this was um, from the preface of the published memoirs of the Manchester Lytton Phil um, and tells about the origins of the society. Many years since, a few gentlemen, inhabitants of the town, who were inspired with a taste for literature and philosophy, formed themselves into a kind of weekly club for the purpose of conversing on subjects of that nature. These meetings were continued with some interruption for several years, and many respectable persons being desirous of becoming members, the original numbers were increased so far as to induce the founders of the society to think of extending their original design. Presidents and other officers were elected, a code of laws formed, and a regular society constituted and denominated the Literary and Philosophical Society of Manchester. Early meetings were held at the Assembly Coffee House until in October 1781 it was decided by ballot that the society should move to the back room of the Unitarian Cross Street Chapel, which is where um, Thomas Barnes, who was another founding member, was minister. Um, oh, I think I've got a pit. There he is. There's the Cross Street Chapel and there's Thomas Barnes, looking very intellectual. Um, and it wasn't until 1799 that the society moved into its own purpose-built premises, which was um, a move that was common to other learned societies around that time. Um, the annual subscription price was one guinea. They met on Wednesday evenings for two hours. Um, members wishing to speak must uh, submit a paper to be approved by the secretary on the subject of natural philosophy, Theoretical and experimental chemistry, polite literature, civil law, general politics, commerce and the arts. And once approved, they'd be given no more than half an hour on the topic, followed by a discussion. Um, quite familiar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. A committee was formed for the selection of the best papers, um, which would be included in its memoirs, which came out once every two years. Um, and the memoirs were sort of, I mean, some have said that the memoirs were an important part of the society becoming um, a sort of um, established uh, cultural force because of, um, and the, the memoirs were quite successful and um, they went into, um, they, I think, oh, I don't know, I don't know figures, but there were quite a lot, more than you would think, um, published. Um, so 
As well as the order, ordinary members, there was a class of honorary members, which included John Aiken, Erasmus Darwin, Benjamin Franklin, Joseph Priestley, and James Beattie, amongst others. Um, so of the 25 original members, more than half were physicians, surgeons, or apothecaries um, connected with the local royal infirmary. Only one, Barnes, was a minister of religion. Um, of all those with degrees, only one was from an English university and the rest were from Scottish universities. Um, despite Francis Nicholson's claim that the society had no connection with Warrington, um, by the time the second vol volume of the memoirs was published in 1785, at least 14 members were Warrington alumni. Six of the 20 tutors at Warrington were either ordinary or honorary members of Manchester, these were John Aiken, William Enfield, Ralph Harrison, Joseph Priestley, Gilbert Wakefield and George Walker. Um, and then four of those, Aiken, Enfield, Priestley and Wakefield, were involved in teaching the Bell Lecture at Warrington. Um, although the majority of papers published in the memoirs were on scientific topics, and this is what the society is really known for as being a sort of scientific society, um, in the early years, between 1781 and 1783, there, there, there were lots of papers being published on um, taste and improvement, um, and here's some of them. This was this is all in the first volume, volume of the memoirs, so we've got things like on the nature and essential characters of poetry as distinguished from prose, um, on the influence of the imagination and the passions upon the understanding, um, and I'm just going to um, look at some of these papers in a bit more depth um, to sort of illustrate the kind of debates that were going on. Um, I should add as well that um, all these papers were, they often said um, at the start, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just throwing out some ideas and, and um, I look forward to the discussion. So that it, was all, it was very much about having a discussion. Um, uh, so in October 1781, Thomas Henry presented a paper on the advantages of literature and philosophy in general, and especially on the consistency of literary and philosophical with commercial pursuits. I love the, all the long titles of 18th century stuff. It really bumps up your word count. Um, <laughs> in it, Henry argues for the education of the manufacturing and merchant classes um, and sort of uh, echoing Scottish Enlightenment ideas about civic humanism and improvement. Um, he argued that the minds of the commercial class should be occupied with learning or they could succumb to extravagance and vice. Um, he says, the pursuit of knowledge, when properly directed and under due influence, is of the greatest importance to mankind. In proportion as a nation acquires superior degrees of it, her state of civilization advances and she becomes distinguished from her less enlightened neighbours by a greater refinement <coughs> in the manners of her inhabitants and a departure from those ferocious vices which mark the features of savage countries. Um, but he underlines the need for restraint. Learning is a force for good as long as it is properly directed and in proportion. And in doing this, he sort of positions himself as a kind of moral, um, moralist, uh, in a sort of Addison and Steele style. And, and he quotes um, Addison as well. Um, when he says, um, a man of polite imagination not only secures himself a favour favourable reception in the world, but as Mr. Addison observes, is let into a great many pleasures that the vulgar are not capable of receiving. Above all, for Henry, is the need to apply reason over passion, which, if left unchecked, becomes criminal and ought to be resisted. Um, he, Henry also promotes um, an education of vernacular literature, um, which is reminiscent of Priestley's um, 1965, 1765 essay on a course of uh, liberal education for civil and active life. So this is Henry says, the English classics will be a rich fund of entertainment and improvement. Shakespeare, Milton, Pope, Addison, Thompson, Gray, Mason, with a long list of excellent writers in prose and verse, 
will yield him charming refreshments after the fatigues of the day. He may even indulge himself in sweet converse with the fair sex. A Montague, a Carter, a Barbel and a Seward justly d demand his notice and will prove his most delightful companions, refine his taste, polish his manners and ameliorate his morals. Um, I've not really said anything about the um, comment about the, the sweet converse of the fair sex, but I think that's quite important, this idea of um, women being sort of um, there to soften um, and refine. Um, so ultimately for Henry, a taste for polite literature has a restraining influence on behaviour um, and it contributes to middle class improvement. Um, likewise, Barnes's paper um, on the nature and essential characters of poetry from December 1781 argues that poetry can be the means by which the imagination is elevated, the heart delighted and the noblest passions of the human soul expressed, improved and heightened. Another paper by Barnes on the affinity subsisting between the arts develops the idea that a uh, broad-ranging education is preferable to specialisation in one field. An appreciation and education in the arts, he argues, is essential for the improvement of trade and industry. Barnes proposes a plan for the education of, spills, uh, of skilled workers. It's now more necessary than ever that our artists and workmen in the different branches shall be possessed of some kind of taste. And in fact, um, Barnes, uh, oh no, it wasn't Barnes, oh no, who was it? Um, I think it was Barnes, helped to set up the um, Manchester College, um, which was seen as a sort of continuation of Warrington and was aimed at the education of sort of... Um, gentlemen destined for the professions. Um, so, but not all, not all the members of the society felt this way, and this is like the sort of um, the real um, criticism of all these um, papers, which was the Reverend Samuel Hall. Um, in his 1782 paper, an attempt to shew that a taste for the beauties of nature and the fine arts has no influence favourable to morals, um, he argues that an appreciation of the arts can become an extravagance um, without the sobering influence of religion. Um, he rejects Henry's arguments, instead in asserting that taste and moral character are not synonymous. He reproaches the irritability of a Pope and a Grey and the voluptuousness of a Montague and a Chesterfield. Ultimately, he's concerned with the development of the idea that morals can be grounded in something other than religion. Um, and perhaps tellingly Hall was an Anglican in a society which is, was dominated by dissenters um, and actually I, I was reading um, the Lindops de Quincey um, biography and he taught, and Samuel Hall was the uh, guardian of um, de, the young de Quincey and the de Quincey had these awful nightmares of what Samuel Hall used to, how he used to teach him. So he used to make him um, just uh, memorise long, awful, boring sermons and he would have to um, then regurgitate them word for word and he, and he hated it. Um, so anyway, that's just an aside. <laughs> um, so the, overall, the early years of the Manchester Society um, highlight a sort of a preoccupation with questions of taste and improvement, or maybe not a preoccupation, but there was certainly a debate going on at the time. Um, uh, and then after that, sort of more uh, utilitarian concerns take over um, after the 1790s. Um, so now I'm going to look at Newcastle um, and how certain uh, concerns when that society was being set up, um, cast light on some tensions within the Manchester Society. So, um, although at its inception the Newcastle Society's founders paid tribute to the influence of the Manchester Society, in many cases Newcastle chose to branch off from the Manchester model. 
Um, Newcastle made clear from the outset that its emphasis was on um, local concerns like antiquarianism and local geology. Um, they were particularly concerned with um, sort of coal surveys and things like that. Um, although Manchester had expressed an interest in such topics, it was never of prime importance. Newcastle was one of the first of the Littenfields to be established after um, Manchester and as I said before it was, its foundation was largely credited to William Turner. Um, Turner had strong Unitarian connections from an early age. His father was a Unitarian minister at Wakefield and he was friends with Joseph Priestley who was then minister at Leeds. Um, Turner went to study at Warrington Academy in 1777, aged 16, um, and the principal at the time of Turner's attendance was William Enfield, who taught theology, language, literature, history, belles lettres, commerce, mathematics, natural philosophy, geography and elocution <laughs> um, between 1770 and 1785. Um, Turner was taught theology by John Aiken. And following Aiken's death, it was decided that Turner should um, finish his final year of education at um, Glasgow, um, studying divinity. Um, in 1782, Turner was appointed minister of the Hanover Square um, Chapel in Newcastle, where he would stay until his, his retirement. And it's um, quite easy to draw comparisons here with Thomas Percival. Um, they, they've both been educated at Warrington um, and then Thomas Percival had been educated at uh, Edinburgh before he came to Manchester. Um, it's not clear how close the two were. Um, they both attended Warrington but Percival left 16 years before Turner's involvement, uh, enrolment. Um, but they were certainly acquainted and they had mutual friends. Um, and in fact, Turner um, wrote a sort of little bio, I can't remember what it was called, but he wrote um, an article sort of with a little biographical sketch of all the, the students at Warrington, and he was like very um, full of praise for, pre uh, for Percival. Um, and Turner was an, had been elected an honorary member of Manchester in 1783, and he'd given a paper there. Um, uh, as with Manchester, Newcastle had begun life as weekly informal meetings um, with a group of friends for the purpose of intellectual discussion. Um, in 1792, it was suggested by Turner that Newcastle would benefit from a society which gathered to discuss literary and, and uh, scientific topics. Um, and then after this initial suggestion, um, the idea quickly gathered pace. Um, Turner was requested to produce a pamphlet with a statement of his case. Speculations on the propriety, propriety of attempting the establishment of a literary society in Newcastle were circulated and discussed before the formal meeting was held to establish the society. Um, this meeting took place on the 24th of January 1793. Oh, is it the anniversary? No. Yeah. Um, it was held at the Assembly Rooms. Um, a committee was formed and a general meeting was set for the following Thursday at the dispensary in order to submit the, the plan. Um, in February the plan was sub submitted and the society formally established and the rules were set out. Members were invited to converse on mathematics, natural philosophy, history, chemistry, polite literature, antiquities, civil history, biography, questions of general law and policy, commerce and the arts. Um, as with all lit and fills at this time, um, discussion of religion and politics were explicitly forbidden. Um, there were two classes of mem members. Ordinary members paid one guinea annually and they were only eligible if they lived within five miles of Newcastle. Honorary members could live further afield and they weren't liable to expense. Um, and some honorary members included Joseph Priestley and Matthew Bolton and Joseph Banks. Um, so Turner's plan sets out his expectations for the new society um, and it demonstrates a keenness for local improvement above all else, specifying in detail several topics which he believed would benefit the town. Even so, despite its distinctly local flavour, the plan is striking in its similarity to Percival's introduction 
So the newly formed society at Manchester, published 12 years previously. Um, so, oh, there's William Turner. Um, okay, so I'm just going to spend a little bit of time looking at the two different plans for the societies. Um, sorry about the quality of the right hand one. So, um, Percival's Manchester introduction um, reads, Men, however great their learning, often become indolent and un unambitious to improve in knowledge for want of associating with others of similar talents and acquirements. Having few opportunities of communicating their ideas, they are not very solicitous to collect or arrange those they have acquired, and are still less anxious about the further cultivation of their minds. But science, like fire, is put in motion by collision. Where a number of such men have frequent opportunities of meeting and conversing together, Thought begets thought, and every hint is turned to advantage. Uh, Turner's Newcastle plan reads, Among the various causes of the rapid advancement of science, which has taken place in modern times, the institution of philosophical societies is one of the most obvious and important. Men, by their uni united labours, accomplish undertakings far superior to the efforts of individual strengths, and this is particularly the case with intellectual pursuits. Knowledge, like fire, is brought about by collision, and in the free conversations of associated friends, many lights have been struck out and served as hints for the most important discoveries, which would not probably have occurred to their authors in the retirements of private meditation. Um, um, it's just worth noting how similar those are. Um, and in fact, um, John Mead, traces this um, idea of knowledge production as a collision between minds to Isaac Watts' 1741 book, Improvement of the Mind, um, which was an influential textbook both Percival and Turner would have been familiar with from their days at Warrington. Um, it was a textbook which um, was quite popular and went into several editions. Um, so this is Isaac Watts's quote, uh, in free and friendly conversation, our intellectual powers are more animated and our spirits act with a superior vigour in the quest and pursuit of unknown truths. Um, often has it happened in free discourse that new thoughts are strangely struck out and the seeds of truth sparkle and blaze through the company, which in calm and silent reading would never have been excited. By conversation you will both give and receive this benefit as flints when put into motion and striking against each other produce living fire on both sides, which would never have risen from the same hard materials in a state of rest. So for John May, the idea of a mode of intellectual discussion that made room for a certain amount of disagreement among, uh, provides, and friction provides a contrast with a discourse of politeness associated with Addison and others. For what, as with Turner and Percival, conversation, in theory at least, is the most desirable mode of knowledge production. In practice, however, the Newcastle Society sometimes struggled to maintain these free conversations of associated friends that Turner had originally hoped for. Indeed, some years later, a bitter, a bitter dispute broke out <coughs> over Turner's involvement in scientific lectures in a rather more ungentlemanly episode than he had perhaps anticipated when he first wrote of collision. In a letter to Turner in 1793, when the society was, um, it, it was a letter in response to, the, to Turner's plan, um, James Anderson criticised the Manchester Society for what he perceived as a defect in the makeup of the membership. Uh, he warned Turner that the dominance of eminent members in a society would lead to um, the suppression of new and exciting discovery. Um, he says, where men of high literary character constitute the leading members of such a society, a want of energy is usually the consequence. This is the case with the philosophical societies of London, Edinburgh and Manchester in an eminent degree. And wherever that languor prevails, the real ends of such an institution are frustrated. I give this hint that in the beginning you may try to guard against this evil in your society. Um, Anderson castigates the uninteresting tradition of society members dryly reading a paper and receiving polite applause from the audience <laughs> and emphasises instead 
freedom restrained only by the rules of politeness that comes from allowing younger members to play a more active role. His letter demonstrates a keenness to learn from the experience of Newcastle's predecessors in optimising this collision of minds which societies such as Manchester and Newcastle were so keen to promote. Um, at first, Turner appears to have heeded Anderson's advice. His plan acknowledges a need for the promotion of learning amongst younger members. Might societies not, he argues, be made to answer a salutary moral purpose by encouraging in our youth a love of literature and an ambition to distinguish themselves among the members of these societies. Um, the original rules state that in order to encourage a taste for literature in the younger members of the community, it be allowed to any member to introduce a young person between the ages of 17 and 21, um, and there would be no subscription fee for these young members. Um, but strangely, the rule concludes that this class of visitors be expected to withdraw immediately after the reading of papers is concluded. So they were allowed to listen to the papers, but they weren't allowed to be there for the discussion, which is quite bizarre. Um, there was also some encouragement of extending membership to a wider public by the, introduce, the introduction of a class of honorary members. This was for the express purpose of encouraging the exertions of deserving per persons who discover a taste for literature but whose circumstances render it inconvenient to incur the expense of ordinary contribution. By 1801, there were 300 such members, which is the same number as ordinary members. Um, and in 1799, a new class of reading members was added, which allowed use of the library without them attending the meetings. And women were eligible for inclusion in this class, but there wasn't much of a take up. Um, there was only one woman member in 1801 and two in 1804. And such me measures suggest a desire for the society to, beco to become more democratic and inclusive, if not potentially paternalistic. Um, one group within the membership of the Newcastle Society became concerned that the society was becoming little more than a repo repository for books. In the mid-1800s, R.M. Glover complained that our society has become little more than a large reading club. In 1813, Turner was moved to form a society within the society, a literary club, um, which he did this with, um, with James Losh, um, who was sort of acquainted with uh, Wordsworth and Coleridge. Um, and he did this as a response to concerns that members were becoming more passive readers rather than play, playing an active role in discussing books. Um, but um, was this a facilitation of free and friendly conversation or was it just making discussion of books a, a more sort of exclusionary activity? Was it becoming a sort of click? Um, but I don't know what the answer to that question is. Um, there were also differing attitudes to the sharing of knowledge between societies in the region. In May 1789, the Philosophical and Medical Society in Newcastle allowed Turner to examine their minutes on condition that he didn't make a copy. Um, but when the Bolton, and Literary, Bolton Literary and Philosophical Society was estab established in 1813 for the cheerful communication of useful knowledge, their request to view Manchester's papers was refused. Clearly, a free-flowing network of creative endeavour is a somewhat idealistic view of things. In reality, um, I think there's a sort of reluctance to share information because I think part of the reason that the literary and philosophical societies came into being was a sort of uh, what. Uh, from a need to establish themselves as a sort of uh, centre of like civic pride sort of thing. Um, I don't know. Um, so to conclude, it would be easy to say that the influence of Warrington and the dissenting community and ideas of the Scottish Enlightenment um, and sort of... <laughs> 
I sort of see it as being the Warrington uh, Academy sort of branching out and dispersing and, and these people were um, setting up societies and, you know, often they were honorary members of the same societies and things. Um, it would be easy to look at that and say that, that there was a regional network, um, but I, d uh, I think that sort of... Uh, simple concept fraught with difficulties um, it wasn't quite the free flow of, in, of conversation and the pursuit of knowledge um, which each society envisaged it was more difficult than that um, tensions about taste improvement and learning um, were being played out both within societies and within the broader um, regional basis Thank you. Quite a small window for yeah. oh, no. questions and uh, discussion. Just to finish on the dots at half past, so people have time to pack up. But um, we can obviously revisit some of the ideas raised in the discussion tomorrow. But we do have a few minutes. So any any questions or thoughts? Any questions? Just a, a thought. I have nothing really to say apart from to put it out there. That lots of people seem to have been talking about pleasure today. Mm -hmm. Many of the papers sort of lurking behind what people are saying. Um, and I wonder what its place is when we're thinking about kind of the moment of connection between an individual and a wider, wider group, um, whether or not pleasure is in the end an individual experience or whether there's a way in which there can be spaces that encourage or support some kind of sense of communal pleasure. I don't know if it's the same as entertainment, for instance. Does anyone? <laughs> There's not really um, no, but I, I think I mean, it's certainly an issue, isn't it? That well, I mean, we we touched on this earlier, but certainly when it comes to artists and actually people who uh, copy artists' work as as amateurs or pupils, there is this certainly in art history something well we don't like really talking about the the satisfaction of the job or the pleasure that it might be to 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 make marks on on the surface of a canvas or a page. So. I don't actually have an answer to that, but it, it's certainly something that I'm always coming up against and I want to address, but actually I, I do find that there's sometimes a resistance to it in art history. <laughs> um, I mean, it's a good point in terms of the nitrous oxide experiments because um, one of the things I find intriguing about them is that they're often sold as a, as a sort of a... I mean, I, I mentioned you know the democratisation of the experience and have sort of reservations about that idea because one of the ways it's often talked about is that it is a group of people sort of with similar ideas, similar ideological beliefs, kind of sharing the pleasure of these things, both scientific but also in terms of entertainment. But actually, on one level, it was a collective sort of laughter, but mm -hmm. there was an individuality to each experience. They tried to dress it up or create this idea of a collectivism. But actually, what you would often have was people would be people inhaling the gas on their own, <laughs> frantically laughing and being incapable of actually connecting with the people around them. So often you'd have this strange sort of dissipation of laughter where people would laugh at the people laughing and there wasn't a kind of collective laughter. I mean, Vertoy talks about laughter as something that does unite people in a brief moment of, of, of shared experience. But that, I'm not really sure that is quite what happens in that way. So it is an interesting point, I think. Mm. So mm. nitrous oxide is a disassociative, isn't it? Yeah. So that's like you, you you taking yourself away from yeah. anything. Yeah. Even if you're doing it in a group, you're taking yourself away. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Just, sorry, I can't see it. Well, no, I was just think, thinking about this and, and about the way you were interesting, interestingly connected that experience to kind of live experience, um, and thinking you know back to the kind of basic kind of different versions of the sublime, particularly the Birkin distinctions that we find distinction makes between something that's pleasing and something that's sublime and yeah, beautiful yeah. as opposed to something that's just pleasing like a lady um, <laughs> with a nice soft face but then there comes a weird point where after that the sublime is pleasurable but only because we're removed from it mm. and kind of come into more of a, a, a internalised experience of it so rather than what a thing that is sublime the way we experience the sublime so is it so, you know nitrous oxide is something that creates this pleasurable is it I don't even know if it is, from the way you describe it, I don't know if it sounds pleasurable, if it sounds like, is it a pleasurable sublime or is it 
The, the, the accounts I've read, I think it was pretty pleasurable. Well, I mean, the, the strange thing is, you know... Intensity. Yeah. There's a weird relationship there, isn't there? But there's a kind of... For those of you who kind of know, know the history of it all, there is this kind of... I mean, this is one of the reasons why... One of the many reasons why I don't really know what to do with them is that, you know, it's all just sort of... To a degree, it's sort of fabrication. You know, they kind of... They just dress up their experiences, not just as sublime, but also that they are actually getting this hit. And Davy does experiments where, uh, and he sort of winks at Coleridge while he's doing it, where he, he gives somebody something that isn't nitrous oxide, and they perform the, that sort of sublime experience. Um, so there's a kind of, um, uh, yeah, there's a sort of sort of fraud to it all as well. Um, so it both they like to think of it as playable, and for some of them perhaps it was, but then there's also the sort of the fake as well. It doesn't translate That's to other areas. It's a sort of placebo sublime, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's the idea that you're taking a chemical into your body that's creating the effect of sublimity because, because of the terror of, kind of messing with your chemistry. Mm. Well, one other thing, I mean, when you say that, the first thing that pops into my head is the stuff that, that, that I read for tomorrow's group about um, one of the accounts talks about how, you know, if you haven't read them and if you haven't been drinking the whiskey, you're not going to get the effect. <laughs> and it's sort of a similar sense of that sort of necessity, right? But also the fact that they are all, so, they're all looking for this and they're all wanting to kind of continue with that, yeah. I just want to let Will kind of... No, it was just that... Talking before about the, the temporal axis and the spatial axis, and what they were saying that often, because you were telling us that letters are being written between people being, I took this amazing uh oxide, and then someone else would take it and they would write it someone else. So they're not... Not only is they're having the same chemical, or in some cases not the same chemical, but let's assume for the moment they're having the same chemical. They are part of a community, but you know, like any drug, they're all having very, very different experiences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But <clears throat> by not all being in the same room to have the experience, they can kind of mediate a similar experience through writing a letter because there's a, there's a constraint on what you can put in a letter about your experience. And I guess I was kind of thinking it's kind of a chain of a community because if someone's recommended something to you in these terms, but you weren't there when they took it. Then you go and take it, you obviously got their terms of sure. what they and so those terms become a kind of a very stable community of what the reaction to something is. Yeah. And that, that works with placebos as well, I guess, because you could ask someone what they thought if they'd already been told certain things. Yes. You get you get back what you put in already, right? Precisely. Um I think there is an element of that. I mean Davies Davies documentation of it is that you know there's people they come to Bristol and of course people then come to Bristol expecting this to happen um, there is I think and I think for me one of the things I find interesting is that sort of adoption of language from uh, other areas in order to try and sort of establish some meaning to an experience that they can't fathom really but yeah I think that sort of uh, that linear idea is probably a very good one really um, one of the other things that struck me was taste, like just how much sort of taste seemed mm -hmm. to be. Like that's what happened with Davy and everyone as they tried to sort of establish a taste in a sort of Wordsworthian way. And, but with you guys, it was sort of uh, benefactors, right? Or, or um, and then the way they're yeah. trying to sort of control a conservative one, or even what's like, tasteful. Yeah, in yeah. you know, kind of actually is a huge, enormous one man show tasteful <laughs> within yeah. even your actions rather than just your your work that you make move for you actually are your actions are you are you are you making the right kind of moves in a particular atmosphere of a particular community so yeah i like to think of that and also as you say kind of a more taste in terms of maybe aesthetics or yes yeah, it's a way of saying paintings. we we are an authority <laughs> this is what is good taste. These are the authors that that are, that constitute good taste. Um, it's just a way of asserting themselves, I think. Okay. 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 Sorry, but um, Jenny's paper I mean, was the, at the heart of that one was that the kind of real tension, isn't there, in that quotation between sparkle, yeah, and serenity, yeah, um, free so flow of conversation. Yeah, so and thinking about creativity. Uh, there's that battle going on there, isn't it, between yeah. sparkle and serenity, yeah. between solitude and the community, but wanting to create sparkle, which is conflicted and mm -hmm. disruptive, mm -hmm. against that kind of modifying uh, capacity of politeness. Mm -hmm. So and I think in, in all three papers, there's something of that tension going on. Mm -hmm. I mean, to turn myself about mm -hmm. is 
potentially you know, egotistical assertion and, and the imposition of other kind of paradoxically a kind of politeness upon the community yeah. in yeah. Norwich, which then they're not buying literally. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but I just want to, in the case of laughter, there's something of that as well, isn't there, in terms of um, about the discourse of laughter Ra rather than humour. I thought it was more focused on yeah. the physiological act of the laugh, or you know, if you're in, from this part of England, the laugh. <laughs> um, you know, and, uh, and, uh, actually bringing that in within the bounds of knowledge but also within the bounds of creativity versus politeness I mean in some ways there's something potentially always disruptive and impolite about the laugh yeah. or mm -hmm. the laugh, sorry, keep Johnson <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Johnson does that Johnson does that kind of aspect about laughter really well I think, yeah. I think that's true I mean I think that I remember I sort of <coughs> I said to Sharon Rustin last summer something about like you know China things like these and we didn't really talk about them but she did sort of very clearly say to me yeah the problem with that I mean they, it's, it's not really about humour and I mean she's kind of right really they're not it's not really about it's sort of trying to figure out the sort of physiological mm. or mental processes that are taking place within those experiences um, I think that's probably true I think it is and I think there is something sort of Again, it's sort of domestic. There's this sort of, I think one of the things that's interesting is that sort of the wild gas idea, but in terms of a sort of radical aesthetic, but the wildness of laughter also sort of infiltrates that as well, actually. It's sort of domesticated and made safe within that environment, but there is something sort of rupturing about laughter. Yeah. Mm. Okay, thank you, everyone. I'll, I'll cherry it away. Um, <laughs> just, I'd like to thank uh, the three speakers again for a really interesting um, panel. <laughs>